Our gospel reading this morning comes from the gospel according to Mark. This morning we're in the eighth chapter, and we're reading from verse 27 through 38. Our reading can be found on page 820 in the Pew Bible, or if you have your own Bible or a Bible app to follow along, please feel free to do so. So let us attend to God's word for us this Sunday morning. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, The Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Would you please join me in prayer? Holy Spirit, blow through this place be the the spirit that uh, breathes out the words I speak and be the spirit interceding between what is spoken and what is heard that only what is from you might take root that you would be glorified through Christ our Lord Amen So this morning we are in the, the eighth chapter of Mark's gospel we are in fact right in the middle of the Gospel of Mark. This is, this is the heart of what Mark has written. Here in, this, in the middle of the Gospel, Mark is trying to highlight what is central, what is important. And here in the eighth chapter, we are, we are walking along with Jesus and his disciples as they are heading to the area of Caesarea Philippi. And they're walking along the road, and, and Jesus asks a simple question. What are people saying about me? Who do they think that I am? Yeah. He's doing, doing a poll, an opinion poll, right? He asks them, what are people saying? And they say, well, some, some say John the Baptist. Yeah. Not that he was John the Baptist literally, but that he was taking on what, what John the Baptist had been doing. He's like the new John, you know? fulfilling what what John had been starting. Others said, well, you're Elijah. Elijah, that great prophet of the Old Testament who confronted the king and queen Ahab and Jezebel, who confronted the priests of of Baal, the chief idol of that time. Elijah, who listened to God speak in that still, small voice. And Elijah, the one that that the prophets say would come before the beginning of the end. In the very last verses of the Bible, of the Old Testament, we're told that Elijah will come before that great and terrible day of the Lord. And people say, maybe maybe that's who Jesus is. Maybe he's, he's Elijah, come to initiate the beginning of the end here. And others said, well, we don't know. I mean, he does, he does great things, he heals, he teaches, he must be a prophet. He's just, yeah, he's one of the prophets, but we don't really know. But at, 
the end of the, of the opinion poll, Jesus turns to his disciples and says, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? That is the central question of the gospel. Right? Who do you say that Jesus is? That is the key question we need to ask ourselves as we think about what it means to live this life and live out the faith. Who do you say that I am, Jesus says to the disciples. And, and Peter, Peter raises his hand and says, oh, 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 I know. Right? It's like, you know, that, that children's sermon, you know, we all know what the right answer is at a children's sermon, right? Remember hearing about a, a pastor sitting down with the kids, telling them a story and saying, you know, you know that, that, that little creature, that furry creature that lives in the trees with a bushy tree? bushy tail and, and eats nuts. He says, you know what that is, right? And the kid thinks to himself, well, it sounds like a squirrel, but it's got to be Jesus. Right? <laughs> yeah. Peter knows the right answer. You're, you're the Messiah. You're the Christ. You're the chosen one of God. Right? He gives, he gives the, the Sunday school answer. But Jesus' response is, don't tell anybody. Years ago, when I studied martial arts, my, my teacher was very, you know, taught very freely and, and told his students, you know, you can, you can help one another out, but you're not permitted to teach outsiders what you're learning here. And it wasn't because everything was so secretive or because he was trying to, you know, make sure and build up his school and not have others competing. He wanted to make sure that before we taught anybody, we understood what it was we were teaching, that we really had it down, that we understood not only techniques, but, but we understood the philosophy, I mean, the purpose behind what we were doing. Because he knew that if we, if we went out and taught without really knowing what we were teaching, it wasn't going to do anybody any good. Yeah. Jesus is saying the same thing to his disciples. Don't go telling people I'm the Messiah, that I'm the Christ, because you don't understand what that means. You'd be doing more harm than good. And then he takes his disciples and he says, let me, let me tell you what it means. What it really means to be the Messiah. And he, he takes them aside and he teaches them that the, the Son of Man, that Jesus, the Messiah, he says he has to suffer. Suffer many things and then be rejected by the elders and, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, okay. that all the important people are going to reject him. And then he says, I'm going to be killed. And after three days, rise again. And Peter, Peter who had the right answer, okay, he pulls Jesus aside and said, no, 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 you're wrong. That's not what Messiah is about. We all know what the Messiah is supposed to do. He's supposed to, to come and, and kick out the Romans and establish a new kingdom and make things right. I don't know what you're talking about, but you got it wrong, Jesus. Right? Do you ever do that? Do you ever contradict the one in charge? Right? Yeah. I remember as a kid, um, yeah, I, was, I was kind of a smart aleck. Okay. Um, I may still be, I don't know, but... Um, <laughs> But my mom would say, you know, in the morning, you got to make your bed. Mom, what a waste of time. I'm just going to unmake it at the end of the day anyway. I'm going to sleep in it again. Why should I bother making my bed? And of course, mom's response was, because I told you so. I didn't have the, the wisdom or the, the common sense at the time to realize that, you know, if you make your bed in the morning, that, you know, first of all, your room looks nicer. If you have pets and they jump up on the bed, the hair is going to get on the bedspread and not on your sheets where it's going to cause allergy problems. Yeah. That it's more comfortable to sleep in a bed that's been made in the morning and, and the sheets have been smoothed. Yeah. There are all kinds of good reasons to do it the way she said. But I thought I knew better. Right? That's what Peter's doing. Yeah. He's telling Jesus, I know better. 
And don't we do that all the time? Don't we think we know better than God? Aren't we constantly telling God how he should do things? Eh, you know, that, that God, you, you really, you need to, you need to ad- address illness in this way. You need to heal these people. And you really should, you know, those people aren't so good, you should smite them. Yeah. And we're telling God how he should be handling things in our life. It's not going the way I think it should, God. What are you doing wrong? Right? And we look at the world, and, and it's not the way we think it should be. And it's like we're pulling God aside and rebuking him, telling him how he should be doing things. And Jesus takes Peter aside. He looks back at his disciples and he says, you know, this kind of behavior, eh, it's that <laughs> this is the bad apple that ruins the whole barrel. Eh? This kind of thing catches on. And so he rebukes Peter harshly. He says, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind godly things, but, but human things. He says, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter was concerned about the nation of Israel. He was concerned about, about you know, the, the Romans who were taking over his nation. He was concerned about Jesus' reputation and what was going to happen to Jesus. And these are all valid concerns. Jesus doesn't say that they're not. He says they're merely human concerns. They're concerns, they're valid, but they're lesser. And he should be concerned about the things of God. And then he, he wants to make it clear what this really means to be the Messiah, what it really means and why Peter is mistaken. And so he takes not only his disciples, but the whole crowd, calls them in and says, let me, let me tell you what this all means. If you want to understand who I really am, if you want to follow me, if you want to be taught by me, well, here's what it looks like. If you want to be my disciple, that is my student, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That doesn't fit with merely human concerns. Why would we want to follow someone who's going to make us deny ourselves? I mean, don't we want, don't we want the best life we can have? Don't we want health and wealth and wisdom? Don't we want to be successful in everything we do? We look for, for, for teachers, for gurus, for self-help books, yeah. for life coaches yeah. who are going to help us not deny ourselves but fulfill those things we want. But Jesus says, no, deny yourselves. Yeah. You know, when, when you're tempted to say that that thing in response to some, you know, some kid at recess who said something smart alky or, or worse, has said something bad about somebody who's a friend, and you want to come back with that quick response, and you deny yourself. You, you control your tongue. Jesus says, that's what it means to be my disciple. If we want to follow Jesus, it's a life of denial. And sometimes, you know, usually it's, it's not big things. It isn't, you know, taking holy orders and entering some monastery and, and taking a vow of poverty and of chastity and of, and of stability where you're saying, I'm never going to go anywhere else. That is a form of denying yourself. But so is what you're doing this morning. You've gotten up and come to church instead of you know, watching, you know, watching the, the golf game or being out enjoying this beautiful day, instead of getting a little extra sleep, you've denied yourselves to be here with, with these people 
praising and worshiping our God? What if you did that every day? What if you denied yourself 15 minutes of sleep so that you got up early and, and read your Bible and spent some time in prayer? Yeah. Denying ourselves can be those little things. Right? Those not taking shortcuts, yeah. not taking that, that exam and saying, well, I can get a better grade if I just you know, look at my neighbor's paper. Right? And saying, no, I'm going to do things the right way. Right? Denying ourselves means not taking shortcuts in our work, right? not taking shortcuts in our relationships. Denying ourselves means giving up the right to be right. To say even in that situation with somebody else where where you know they're wrong, but you let it go because that need to be right, you deny that need in yourself for the sake of a relationship. Denying yourself means, you know, looking looking at your checkbook and realizing that If you live in this country, you've got more than you need. And so writing, you know, writing a check, writing a check that's going to go to Presbyterian Disaster Assistance to help people who are dealing with these hurricanes, writing a check to help some international charity that's dealing with the typhoon that happened at the same time over in the Philippines. Maybe writing a little larger check to the church that's going to help with with the ministry that we do. Self-denial. And it's self-denial that isn't isn't just the little things. Jesus says, deny yourself and take up your cross. The cross was there for one thing. It was an instrument of death an instrument of shameful death. Taking up our cross means that we're not going to hold on to our pride. We're not going to hold on to our life for our sake. But we're going to be humble. And we're going to live not for us, but as Jesus says here, for him and for the gospel. Not because it's going to benefit us in some tangible ways that we can think of, but because that's what we're called to because we want to follow this one. If we want to follow Jesus, we deny ourselves. We take up our cross and die to ourselves, die to our need to to do everything for us, die to our need to be right, die to our need to, to have our rights, and instead focus on lifting him up. It's not easy. And why would we do it? We do it because we see who he is and what he has done for us. And as we put our focus on serving him and serving neighbor rather than serving self, we find what we thought we were looking for before. Malcolm Muggeridge is a a British author, writer from the early 20th century. And Mugrid says, you know, I can say that I never knew what joy was until I gave up pursuing happiness. I never knew what joy was until I gave up pursuing happiness. And he goes on and says, I never cared to live until I chose to die. When we put Christ at the center, when we focus on the cross, on what he has done for us and who he calls us to be. And we stop worrying about our conception of what life is all about when we are willing to deny ourselves. Suddenly, life is worth living. Suddenly, we find joy even in the midst of suffering and pain and confusion because the cross is in the middle. When people ask you who Jesus is, 
they're not really asking for the Sunday school answer. You can tell them he's the Christ, he's the Son of God, he's the second person of the Trinity. Let me tell you how all that fits together. And that will mean nothing to them. When people look at you and the way you live, that will speak volumes. Yes, we should be able to answer who Jesus is and we should be able to tell them what the gospel is. But until they see the way it impacts our lives, those answers mean nothing. And so if we want to follow Jesus and we want our friends and our family and our kids and our grandkids to follow Jesus, we need to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow him. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen.